As we begin our lectures here on severe thunderstorms, I just want to do a quick review on the main things you need to know about the four ingredients that are needed to make severe thunderstorms. So here's a quick review. One, you got to have an unstable atmosphere. That means you have to have a negative lifted index and a lot of cape. Two, we need a trigger mechanism, something to lift the air, something to get this all going, like a cold front or a warm front or other types of fronts like dry lines or mountains or sea breezes, all these things that just get air to rise. You have to have plenty of surface moisture. At least 60 degree dew points is a good threshold to be thinking about in order to have enough energy in this storm as that water vapor condenses into liquid water to power the whole storm system. And finally, you need strong wind shear. Wind shear is a change of wind speed and direction with height. You need those winds to change a lot with direction and a lot with height. We're gonna be learning about what that means in this lecture. So when those things come together, you get this picture, which I've shown you before. This is from Jessica Moore showing this beautiful supercell thunderstorm that is sitting right over uh, parts of Montana. Just incredible to see weather like this. So we're gonna unpack a certain type of storm in this video, and then we're gonna move on to tornadoes and supercell cells very, very soon. All right, but before we get there, let's make sure we understand what the Storm Prediction Center will use in terms of its criteria to determine if a thunderstorm is severe. Now, one criteria that is left out is lightning. Every thunderstorm makes lightning, so lightning is not used as a severe thunderstorm criteria. But what is? Well, straight line winds. The Storm Prediction Center says if you have wind speeds over 50 knots, that's 58 miles an hour, they would consider that thunderstorm to be severe. So you can see over here, this is the type of storm we're going to study today, the type that makes strong, straight-line damaging winds. In addition to this, if the thunderstorm makes hail bigger than an inch in diameter, an inch in diameter, it's considered severe. I chased the thunderstorm back in 2003 that produced this hailstone. And I'm going to tell you something. I was absolutely terrified of that thunderstorm because these hailstones fall from the sky well in excess of 150 miles an hour. And as they fall, they do an enormous amount of damage. And I'm just going to tell you this too. Stones this large, when they fall from the sky, they actually whistle a little bit as they fall. They whoosh through the air. And if they hit you, you'll be killed. Stones this large. But only one inch is what's required to be considered severe. And finally, if the thunderstorm produces a tornado, it actually completely trumps the uh, severe thunderstorm warning, goes straight to the tornado warning, is of course considered severe. You're actually seeing the end stages of the most violent tornado in U.S. history right there. It wiped this house off of its foundation. Incredible to see that. So remember this, you don't need all three you just need one of the three in order for the Storm Prediction Center to uh, issue a, uh, a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning. Now remember, the ultimate goal of any storm chase is to not get blown over by the straight line winds, avoid the hail, and safely watch the tornado. I'm going to teach you how to do that. So here we go with some uh, storm chasing 101. One of our favorite resources is the Storm Prediction Center. You've heard me mention that several times. It's a part of NOAA and the National Weather Service. And I'm going to show you some of their old school maps because I think this is kind of nice how they break this down. The new maps are much better color coordinated, but this is a um, this was a map that uh, was from one of my more recent successful chases, and I guess I define success as actually getting to see a tornado back in 2007. Now, I still storm chase quite a bit, but I have a young family, so it's not often for me uh, easy for me to just to get out and and chase. In fact, I do take my kids chasing with me every once in a while. But anyways, uh, this map shows you the different criteria by which the Storm Prediction Center used to basically alert the public to the threat of severe weather. They make maps with arrows, and the new ones are color-coded. You'll see them in a minute. But they have uh, these different risk categories, slight, moderate, high. They've even added a new one called enhanced in between slight and moderate. But basically, they tell you the probability of having one of the three severe uh, types of severe weather within 25 miles of any given point. So when you look at this, let's kind of isolate this map up here, which is our convective outlook map. That's what we call it, a convective outlook map, convective just meaning thunderstorms. And this map tells you the risk of tornadoes. This is the tornado risk. So you can see that in Wisconsin here, there was a 30% probability of having a tornado within 25 miles of any given point inside of that arrow. And the hatching means there was at least a 10% or greater probability of having an EF2 tornado within that hatched area. So that's, that's a high, high risk. Down here, this is the wind uh, probability outlook. So when you look at this, there's a 45% chance of having winds over uh, 58 miles per hour. 
and inside here where there's the hatching, there was a 10% or greater probability of having winds uh, beyond, I believe it's 75 miles an hour. I can't remember the criteria exactly, but I think it's 75. So you can clearly see big risk for severe weather. And finally, we have hail. Again, you can see the probabilities here. So on this particular day, I got to chase a, a storm that actually started here in Tomo, Wisconsin. I chased a tornado from there all the way to Green Bay. And at one point, that tornado was so wide that the damaged swath that cut through the forests here in central Wisconsin, uh, just near Wisconsin Rapids, was actually wide enough to be seen from space. Oh, and it produced hail the size of baseballs. Scared me to death. All right, this is what a new modern Storm Prediction Center map looks like. You see, they've added color coding. They've even added a new ca a category here. You can see this enhanced risk. So remember, it goes general thunderstorm risk. That's this color out here. Marginal risk, which is in here. Slight risk, which is a 15% or greater probability. Enhanced, then it goes to moderate, and then it goes to high. Now, pretty much every single day during thunderstorm season, which again is March to September, you're going to have some part of the country that has a general risk of thunderstorms, that's this color, and you're also going to have a marginal risk of thunderstorms somewhere. Probably four or five days a week, you're going to have a slight risk. Maybe uh, two or three days a week, there might be an enhanced risk. Maybe only, I don't know, 10 to 15 times a year do we have a moderate risk of severe weather issued, which means when we say moderate, we're talking about a uh, high probability of severe weather. And only a handful of times, maybe one, two, three, four, five different times a year, will we actually see a high risk issue. So on this day, uh, back here on the 30th of, of June, we can see that the risk was basically from Wisconsin getting back into parts of Nebraska all the way down into parts of Oklahoma, with the enhanced risk really focused here in Nebraska and Iowa. Now the question is, why was that there? Well, check this out. This is a map of dew point temperature with wind barbs. Now, what I want you to see is 60 degrees is this color right here. See it? So we had a huge section of the country with at least 60 degree uh, dew point temperatures. But do you see right in through here? I'm going to outline this little pocket right in through there. That area had at least 70 degree dew point temperatures. So that's way above our threshold of 60. And then look at this. If you can see this, the wind barbs tell me that the winds are coming in this direction here. See this? But on the other side, they were coming from this direction. That meant right here along this very sharp gradient in dew point temperatures, where there's high dew point temperature to the south uh, of that line and low dew point temperatures to the north, well, there was colliding winds. There's a front here. The air is colliding. See, it's coming out of the south here and out of the north-northwest there. That's our trigger mechanism. There was a front located in that location. Now, I went out and I generated a sounding that was right here in this section of Iowa. And look at this. Was the atmosphere unstable? Absolutely. You can see the difference between your parcel line and your temperature, the environment line. I'm trying to shade in for you here. Cape, we had an enormous amount of Cape. How much did we have? 7,000. 201 joules. Let me erase that. We can barely see it. 7,201 joules per kilogram. Was the lifted index negative? Absolutely. It was negative. Look at 500 millibars. There's the temperature of the environment, and there's the temperature of the parcel. Now, I'm showing you a different type of diagram here, but still, this was a lifted index of about minus 13. And did we have wind shear? Look at this. 10 knots, 25 knots, 30 knots, getting faster and faster and faster up to 50 knots as you would go up. So we certainly had wind shear, but notice it was rather unidirectional. Now, what do I mean by that? We see that the wind direction doesn't change too much. Look, southwest, 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 southwest. These are all kind of southwest winds. And that's an important thing I want you to see here because we have all of our ingredients, but our wind shear is unidirectional, mainly coming from one direction. And that's why on this day, well, first they issued a severe thunderstorm watch. We had all four ingredients. And therefore, right through this area, actually they issued more of them throughout the day down here, but right through this area early in the day, right where we saw, well, there was the front that was in here because the winds were coming from this direction on one side and that direction the other. The dew point temperatures all through this area were over 70 degrees. And we had an unstable atmosphere in here. And as a consequence, well, the National Weather Service through the Storm Prediction Center issued this watch box right in through here. Now, what does a watch mean? We're going to have to discuss that very, very carefully in the next few minutes. But this is what actually happened. 
this was the storm system that was created. So we're looking at a radar reflectivity image here. And there was a long squalling of thunderstorms that went racing through central Iowa, producing a lot of severe weather. And we're going to talk today about this particular configuration of thunderstorms. And you see this feature I'm kind of highlighting in through here? That will be one key feature I want you to learn. See that little fine line on the radar? We're going to talk about that too. So SPC issued the watch because the conditions were favorable. And sure enough, the storms came through issuing the warning. We're going to talk about those two things in the next couple of moments. When it was all said and done, look, wherever we had the front, it was right through here. Wherever we had the high moisture content, remember when we drawn this a couple times? We had the potential for the severe storms. And the atmosphere destabilized in this area, and we had 269 reports of severe weather. There were five tornadoes, those are the red dots, 199 wind reports, four of which were over uh, 75 miles an hour. We then had hail reports, uh, 65 of those uh, were uh, over one inch, and six were over two inches, add them all up, 269. So very, very nasty day in terms of severe weather. All right, what is a tornado watch? What is a severe thunderstorm watch? Well, listen carefully. Watch does not mean somebody is physically watching a tornado or watching a severe thunderstorm. A watch means conditions are favorable, which means meteorologists like me are watching for adequate surface moisture like dew points greater than 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or we're looking for fronts to sweep through that high humidity air like a cold front or a warm front or a dry line. We're looking for the atmosphere to destabilize uh, negative lifted index values are lots of cape. And we're always looking for strong wind shear on our soundings. So remember this, a watch is the less serious of the two things, watches versus warnings. Watch means we're watching conditions, the four ingredients. Okay, that's not mean we're watching a severe thunderstorm. My grandmother, love her to death. She's 86 years old. Every time a W comes on the TV letting her know that there's a weather watch, she automatically assumes that the watch means somebody is watching the severe weather. And I've had to tell her for the last about 25 years that the watch means we're watching conditions. It doesn't mean it's happened yet. Well, when it comes to uh, issuing tornado watches and tornado, uh, I'm sorry, and severe thunderstorm watches, we have two frequency maps down here in the bottom. So our most frequent area for tornado watches is down here near the Gulf Coast in the states of Louisiana, Alabama, the panhandle of Florida, and uh, Mississippi. We can also see kind of a secondary bullseye over here in parts of northern uh, Texas and Oklahoma. When it comes to severe thunderstorm watches, it's really honed in right into this area. So Missouri, parts of Nebraska, getting over there into uh, parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So watches uh, in their frequency distribution maps. All right, warnings. Look at the title. Warning means it's happening now. Okay, tornado warnings, how do we get them? If a tornado has been spotted by an official like a police officer or a firefighter, or if a trained storm spotter through the National Weather Service sees a tornado, they can report it as well. So I'm one of those people. I can report tornado warnings to the National Weather Service. Also, we use Doppler radar. Remember, we can't see tornadoes at night, and sometimes there are tornadoes where there aren't people. So we can use our Doppler radar to be able to indicate, well, like we've learned, hook echoes and red on green velocity couplets. So that's how we get tornado warnings. When it comes to severe thunderstorm warnings, we can use Doppler radar to indicate hail. We do that by looking for radar reflectivity or DBZ greater than 60. We can also use the Doppler radar to detect winds over 50 knots, which is 58 miles an hour. We can use a weather observation station to see those winds over 50 knots or 50 mi 58 miles an hour. Or if a storm spotter or an official, like a police officer, reports hail bigger than an inch, it's warned. Now, warning means it's happening. We have had a long history of false alarms in terms of severe weather in the United States. And partly that's because the National Weather Service places better safe than sorry card. It's also partly because we used to do a county-based warning. Okay, So if we had a severe thunderstorm in any part of a county, we would warn the entire county. And that would, as a result, well, basically warn a lot of people needlessly. We have changed this. This has changed in the last 10 years to now use what we call storm-based warnings. Look at the map that's in the bottom left there. You can see far fewer people are warned because we only warn those people that are directly in the path of the most severe aspect of the thunderstorm. We can use our Doppler radar technology to help us do that. So we can be looking for, you know, hook echoes and velocity couplets. We can be looking for hail bigger than, uh, you know, bigger than an inch on the radar. We can also be looking for those strong storms 
appropriately winds and only warn the people that are in the way. So our false alarm rate is decreasing with time because of technology. Okay, watches versus warnings keep those two things straight. Well, after the severe weather event happens, we log it. We keep track of it. Any report that goes uh, that comes to the Storm Prediction Center, well, they map it. And this is what the storm reports from 2011 look like. Now, 2011 was an extremely busy year for severe weather. But when you look at this, and we look at all the years kind of surrounding it, our kind of decadal average here is that the Storm Prediction Center receives somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 reports of severe weather every year, making the United States the capital for the world in terms of severe weather. We have more of it than pretty much anybody else. On average, we have around 1,200 to 1,400, okay? 1,200 to 1,400. The number that you see here, down here, 1,200, that number represents the 30-year average of tornado reports. But more recently, over the last decade, that number's 1,400 tornadoes per year. Each red dot is a different tornado warning. 2011 was extremely active. Uh, so this, is, this map looks worse than normal. In terms of severe winds, well, severe winds are our most common type of severe thunderstorm uh, 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 type. So the most common type of severe weather. On average, 15,000 reports of severe winds across the United States each year. And finally, we have generally between about eight and 10,000 reports of hail on average. And when you look at it, basically everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains, we have a lot of severe weather that's being reported. Now, it's not that severe weather doesn't happen west of the Rocky Mountains. It's just there's not a lot of people living there to report it. And we uh, don't have uh, a lot of weather observation stations there or Doppler radars in the mountains. But when you get to the west coast, the Mediterranean-type climate there is often a lot more stable than it is on the other side of the mountains, and therefore we don't often have a lot of severe weather up the west coast of the United States. So just kind of wanted to point that out. Oh, and by the way, the southern tip of Florida gets a lot of severe weather, but you notice how there's a hole right here in all three of our images? That's simply because that's where the Everglades are, and people aren't there to report it. They don't live in the swamp, so it's not reported. All right, 20 to 30,000 reports of severe weather each year in the United States. These are some neat maps that the Storm Prediction Center has made showing you the number of days per year where we have severe weather activity. So the total number of severe weather days up here is kind of showed to you in color coding. So the hot spot really in the United States is the Carolinas. Now, why the Carolinas? Well, in terms of total number of severe weather reports, look right down here diagonal from this image. They have a lot of squall lines, and squall lines produce strong straight line winds. And they're so frequent down there that when, it, when you add up squall line wind reports to hail and tornado reports, which are these other two maps, well, that tends to be the place with the most number of severe weather reports. Now, when it comes to hail, let's look at the hail map down here. It's really located right here along the front range of the Rocky Mountains and in Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma. That's our big hail reporting area. When it comes to tornadoes, it's Mississippi and Alabama in Louisiana. Some places down here have between three and six days a year where there is tornado activity. So that's these are all reports within 25 miles of any given location. Now, where I'm making this lecture here in Champaign, Illinois, we have about 20 days on average of severe weather. That comes from either tornadoes, that comes from strong straight line winds, or that comes from severe hail. So this kind of shows you how this looks. Now, to show you how active the severe weather reports are in the southeast in terms of squall lines, take a look at this map in the upper left. This is from the Storm Prediction Center. It's showing you the storm reports on the 4th of April, 2011. This is the most severe weather reports in a single day so far in the Storm Prediction Center's history. Nearly 1,500 reports. There were 635 severe thunderstorm warnings. There were 104 tornado warnings, 12 large tornado watches, and 12 large severe thunderstorm watches. And that's what the map in the upper right-hand corner shows you. But each blue dot in that map in the upper left shows you one of the 1,318 separate severe wind reports. And all of them happen because of this massive squall line you see in this radar image down here in the bottom. That radar image that you see there is kind of a time lapse of showing you throughout time where that squall line went through. And we actually call large events like this derechos. Those are large damaging squall line events. So remember, severe weather reports from strong winds leads in terms of total number of severe weather reports we get annually. And the southeast gets the most. All right. When one of those big squall lines comes over, you often see a cloud like this, taken by one of my students, Stephanie. Now, we like to name our clouds. 
I'm just curious, do you know what we call a cloud like this? I'm talking about this one right here in the picture. It's named after something in a house. Is it a hinge cloud, a wall cloud, a pole cloud, a countertop cloud, or a shelf cloud? What do you think? Well, it turns out the answer to this one is, these are called shelf clouds. I just made up the rest of these. Although the wall cloud is another type of cloud we're gonna talk about very soon when we get to tornadoes. But this, this feature right here is called a shelf cloud. And shelf clouds are terrifying when they come over. They're low hanging, they're fast moving, and they look very rugged, and they look as though, well, like the storm is ready just to wipe you off the face of the earth. But remember this, these clouds are all bark and no bite, okay? We'll talk about that more in just a few seconds. All right, here's another picture of a shelf cloud taken by one of my students, Maggie. A beautiful shelf cloud like this. Now, here's my question. As a cloud like this, this shelf cloud, passes over you, what should you prepare to feel? You see, we're going to study the structure and dynamics of a squall line. We need to know this answer first because this is the leading edge of every squall line. What will you feel as it come over? Will you feel A, a, a blast of very warm, humid air? Will you feel B, nothing? This cloud will pass over you and barely kick up a breeze. Will you feel C, a violently, rapidly rotating, tornado-like wind will accompany this cloud and cause a lot of damage? Or will you get D, a gusty burst of cooler air? Now, many of you watching this video have probably seen one of these clouds once passed over you. Do you remember what happened? Think about it for a second. I'll tell you this. It's not going to be warm when it passes over. It's not B because it will most certainly do some stuff. We'll talk about that in a second. But I want to talk about C versus D. This cloud does not rotate. It is not a wall cloud. It is not a tornado. What you get out of this is after it passes over, you get this burst of cooler air that comes from the downdraft of the thunderstorm. We call it outflow. And this shelf cloud forms in what's called an outflow boundary, and we're gonna study that. Now, check this out. If I were to cut a squall line in half from top to bottom, this is what it would look like. So maybe we can think about it like this. Let's just say that this direction over here uh, is to the south, and this direction over here is to the north. So the whole storm is moving from north to south, okay? That's maybe an easier way to see this. Now, what I've outlined for you is the cloud. So this is the top of the atmosphere. This is way up here. Now we're in the stratosphere where my cursor is pointing. This is the whole depth of the troposphere. That feature I just showed you is right here. And that's where the warm, moist air from the thunderstorm is lifted into the updraft and spread out aloft to make an anvil, an overshooting top, and then a back anvil over here. Now, if we keep looking at this storm, all the heavy precipitation falls just after that shelf cloud passes over you. And what makes these storms so damaging is they have this really strong back to front flow called a rear inflow jet. Now, when you're looking at this cross section, many of you, this is the first time you've seen this. You're like, holy cow, this is complicated. I don't understand it. Well, don't worry about it. I'm going to tell you the three main components of a squall line I want you to know. And we're going to start first with the shelf cloud. So this box I've just outlined here shows you this part of the storm. So the anvil is way up here, that's this part, and the shelf cloud is way down here next to the ground. And the leading edge of the storm, look, the precipitation doesn't start there. This is this little bump you see right here, that's the shelf cloud. The precipitation's all behind it. So this cloud is a warning. It says, hey, listen, the nasty, powerful part of this thunderstorm is coming. It's behind me. You got five minutes to take shelter, okay? So get out your camera, take a picture, and then take shelter. When you get home, send the picture to me so I can put it in my lectures, okay? Now, I'm gonna be teaching about the front part of the storm where the shelf cloud exists and where the outflow exists. Well, they're gonna talk to them about the middle part of the storm where I've labeled main downdraft, and then we're gonna finish by talking about what's called the trailing stratiform region back here. This is the part of the thunderstorm where you just get this light to moderate rain with some lightning and thunder for a couple of hours after the storm passes through. The shelf cloud is the warning. It's warning you about the most dangerous part of the storm, which is the main downdraft here where the rear inflow jet scoots underneath the storm. And then the backside of the storm is just where it rains after the main squall line passes through. Let's go front to back. Now, the major feature of an MCS. Now, what is an MCS? MCS stands for mesoscale. That stands for middle-sized. Convective, that means thunderstorm. And system, which means group of thunderstorms. Okay, so it's a big, long squall line of thunderstorms, okay? The leading edge of the MCS, or squall line, is marked by a gust front. 
And on top of that gust front, which is really just a cool blast of air formed in the downdraft of the thunderstorm, you get a shelf cloud. And we've seen pictures of the shelf cloud. Now check this out. Here's a video taken by a good friend of mine, Jonathan Ramirez. Here is the shelf cloud out ahead of this powerful squall line you see here. Now this cloud you see right here, I'll just pause this. Oops, sorry. This cloud that you see right here is right here on the radar image. Okay, it's out ahead of it. Some of my former students, these are two of my former students who sent me this picture, give me permission to use it, went and took this picture just after the shelf cloud passed over them when they were on spring break. And they knew they had about five minutes after the cloud hit them before the nasty part of the thunderstorm followed. So you see, look, this storm system's moving in this direction from the northwest to the southeast. And that shelf cloud passes over you first. And after it passes, you got a little bit of a break, and then the nasty part of the thunderstorm hit. So they gave me the thumbs up, thumbs up that they were okay, and then they took shelter and got everybody else off the beach. So, using their smarts here from Atmos 120 to know how to be safe out on the beach. So, let's talk about this. That shelf cloud, I don't want you to confuse it with a wall cloud. Now, I'm going to teach you about wall clouds when we talk about tornadoes. Shelf clouds don't spin. They don't rotate. They just advance forward like a big line, like a big arcing line of like, I don't know, like a, like a, like a, I don't know, like, a, like the, the front line of a football team just advancing forward. Okay. What's behind them? Well, what's behind them is the downdraft of the thunderstorm. See it right there? That's the outflow, the cool downdraft of the thunderstorm. And as it advances forward, it lifts warm, moist, and unstable air. Now, you know what happens when that occurs? When you lift warm, moist, unstable air, it makes clouds. So it's this, this boundary between where warm, moist, unstable air is being lifted and cool air from the downdraft is slamming into it, forcing it to rise. When that happens, well, it does something like this. Check it out. One of my former students, Zach, took this incredible picture for me. And I want you to look at the smokestack, okay? You can see that as this shelf cloud approached Champaign-Urbana, see how the smoke was blowing toward it? That's because the inflow of the thunderstorm was coming in like this and rising over the outflow. So there's outflow over here, too. Notice after the shelf cloud passed over, the smoke switched directions. So it's where inflow meets outflow. This outflow is from the downdraft of the thunderstorm, hence the cool, fast winds that come from it. All right? So when a shelf cloud passes over, you're going to know two things. One, it's going to get very dark and windy. And two, it's going to get cool. All right? Let's keep going. On radar, we can sometimes see shelf clouds. This is from the St. Louis, Missouri radar, and you're watching a dying thunderstorm. Now, why is it dying? It's dying because it's occurring late in the night. It's 3 a.m., now 4 a.m., and overnight we lose the, the instability of the atmosphere. So thunderstorms, a lot of times, will decay at night. Not all of them do, but some of them do. Now, when you watch this, I want you to see this fine line of green. Do you see that? That is the radar detecting the shelf cloud. It's passing through it. It's the radar detecting the outflow of the storm. And look, there's a little gap between that shelf cloud and the reds. And those reds are where the severe part of the thunderstorm exists. So the shelf cloud passes over. You get the gust front, the cool blast of, uh, of air. And then the severe part of the storm follows. Now what's neat is outflow boundaries or gust fronts can often survive once the thunderstorm decays. This one continued to propagate all the way through southern Illinois into Kentucky and Tennessee. And the next day in Alabama and Georgia kicked off a new round of thunderstorms. Really neat to see that. Let's keep moving. Here is a very, very important event I want you to never forget. You see, this is a nasty squall line going through the middle part of, um, of Indiana. And you see this feature right here. See it? That is the gust front from this squall line of thunderstorms. Now that gust front labeled with a bunch of arrows was moving right here toward this yellow circle, which is where the Indiana State Fair was. And here's a time lapse. Let's go back, see it again of that squall line moving through. Now, people that were there were at this, I believe it was a Sugarland concert, and they saw this massive shelf cloud approaching. Now, just to let you know, the next couple of images, while they are not graphic, they're gonna show you the, what, well, what strong damaging winds can do. And had these people known that this cloud feature, this shelf cloud, was indicating to them that strong straight line winds were coming, well, they should have abandoned the fairgrounds and gotten away from this area because a few moments after that shelf cloud passed over, 
Well, the winds picked up, and look at what it did to the canvas surrounding the scaffolding for the Sugarland concert. It basically turned all of it into a giant kite, and it fell. And tragically, eight people were killed. That's why I'm teaching about this. I don't want any of my former students mistaking cloud types such that they don't know when the atmosphere is giving them a warning. When a shelf cloud passes over you, know that that shelf cloud is telling you, behind me, there are strong straight line winds and damaging, potentially damaging hail and also deadly cloud to ground lightning. So please don't forget this event. Now, what caused all those straight line winds? Well, the most severe aspect of a mesoscale convective system or squall line is when the storm system creates a bow echo. Now, a bow echo is a section of very high radar reflectivity, so intense precipitation, that bows outward. Now, what am I talking about here? Look at the diagram on the upper right. Here is a line of thunderstorms that as it develops from A to D, you can see the line takes on kind of this bowed shape. Literally, it looks like a hunter's bow that is drawn back under the tension of the string. Now, what I want you to remember is this. Every one of you has access to radar data. It's free in the United States, and when you're living here, you can use it. Well, see down here in this radar image? This part of the thunderstorm is just a squall line, okay? So we can see here that it's relatively linear, it's straight. We do have some pockets of heavy rain. In fact, I even think there's a little bit of hail right here. See the reflectivity value is getting over 60? This is going to produce some strong winds, and it's going to be producing some, uh, some hail and heavy, uh, heavy rain. But nowhere near as nasty as this. You see, the only reason why parts of this thunderstorm are bowing outward, see how it takes a bowed shape like that, is because of strong back to front flow in the storm called the rear inflow jet. It's the black arrows you see right here. And you don't ever want to be at the apex, which is what I'm circling here, of the bow echo. Here's another example. See the squall in the thunderstorms? This is all the bow echo and the strong rear inflow jet, rear meaning backside of the storm, inflow meaning it's coming into the storm from the backside, rear inflow jet is what causes the storm to bow outward. So important lesson, if you're looking at a radar and you see a line of thunderstorms and they are bowing like this, know that you will be getting strong straight line winds if those storms are coming toward you, okay? Please remember that. Now, what follows all of this is something called the trailing stratiform region. It's this big area here of light to moderate rain behind the main part of the thunderstorm, okay? So if we look at this again, I got my diagram of the storm system. So remember, it's moving that direction. We have the rain here, okay? Here comes a shelf cloud, that's first. Then the bow echo, the heavy rain is right in through here. And then all of this is just rain falling out of the clouds. And it's this light rain you see right here that I'm kind of circling. It's all this stuff that's right in through here, all right? So again, three parts. The leading edge, gust front shelf cloud. Behind that, bow echo, squall line. Behind that, trailing stratiform region. What does that mean? Trailing, follow. Stratiform means clouds that develop horizontally rather than vertically like they're doing here. And region just means it's occupying a large space. That's it. Front, middle, and back. Now, before we finish this lecture up, I just want to make sure you've been paying attention. So let's see if you can answer these questions, all right? Which of the following is not a requirement for a thunderstorm to be considered severe? Take a look at your answers here. Got it? It is certainly not D. It's not C. It's not B. The requirement that's not used here is frequent cloud to ground lightning. Every thunderstorm has frequent cloud to ground lightning. Therefore, it is not a requirement used by the National Weather Service to consider a storm severe. What are the uh, severe thunderstorm criteria? Hail bigger than an inch, winds faster than 50 knots or 58 miles an hour, or a tornado. Uh, next question. Below are the conditions on a day in May. Okay, so this is the middle of thunderstorm season. The National Weather Service did not forecast severe thunderstorms on this day. Why? Was it because the lift index was plus four? Was it because the dew points were 71 degrees Fahrenheit? Was it because there was a cold front that was coming through the area? Or was it because the winds near the surface were 10 miles an hour, where the winds in the middle atmosphere were 60? Well, let's think about our ingredients. D, okay, that's a big change in wind speed. That's a lot of wind shear. We need wind shear for severe storms, so D is not the correct answer. Cold fronts are trigger mechanisms. We need a trigger. We need something to lift the air, so C is not the answer. Remember, when I chase, 60 degree dew points are the threshold I'm looking for. So 71 degree dew points are well above that. 
The problem is the lifted index. Remember, you need a negative lifted index, a negative lifted index to get severe weather. So that's why the atmosphere didn't pop and make a big thunderstorm. Last question, this one's quick. On average, how many severe weather reports does the Storm Prediction Center receive each year? This is earlier in our lecture here. Okay, remember it? The answer is C, 20 to 30,000, making the United States the most active place on Earth for severe thunderstorms. All right, here's your final bit of practice. June 11th, 2017, the Storm Prediction Center issued a slight and an enhanced risk for severe storms over parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. What actually happened? This is the storm system that went through. Recognize it? You're looking here at a radar animation. I hope all of you see a bow echo. You see it? Look behind it. There's a trailing stratiform region. All of this. It's the leading edge of that bow echo, though, that we're most concerned about. By the way, did any of you see hail in there as well? See the purples and pinks that are showing up? Pretty amazing to see all of that. Now, let me pause this and show you one other thing. Do you see right here this very faint line? That was the shelf cloud that went over Minneapolis-St. Paul on the leading edge of this squall line. From space, this is the anvil cloud. So we're looking down from above. Cloud top temperatures got down to minus 85 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> That's extremely cold. But why I'm showing you this is the anvil of those thunderstorms covered the entire state of Minnesota. That is enormous. That is a huge and powerful thunderstorm complex. And when it was all said and done, it produced 120 reports of severe winds. It produced 35 reports of large hail. And that thunderstorm complex as it went through, well, it became one of 2017's billion-dollar weather disasters. Now, why? Well, the hail that it produced in the straight line winds not only did a lot of damage in Minneapolis-St. Paul, but it was all of the counties that surrounded Minneapolis-St. Paul, which are very agricultural, agriculturally productive. We're talking about growing corn and soybeans and, and crops like that. And they were wiped out and destroyed. And because of agricultural insurance, there was a huge payout. And that was one of 2017's billion-dollar weather disasters. So, this is why we talk about this. These severe weather events cost money, they can damage property, and they can kill you. So we have to learn about them. What we've got down now is the squall line. In the next couple lectures, we're going to be talking about supercells and tornadoes. So, there you go. Watch out for bow echoes. Watch out for gust fronts with shelf clouds. And remember that when these pass over, the straight line wind damage can be extensive and deadly.